But let me say Neom is the land of the future. But we don't know what the future looks like and it doesn't exist. So we have to build that future, which means we are going to attract the greatest minds and the greatest talents to build that land of the future. And we are developing Neom as a 100% renewable based energy system. But when you look for the sources of energy, then you just have to look around at what we have in Neom. And there's two things that immediately come in mind. One is, of course, solar. We have amongst the highest irradiation worldwide within Neom. And the second thing, which is maybe a bit more remarkable, is wind. We have a very stable and a very abundant wind availability. And the interesting thing is that the wind, which is not a weather phenomenon, but has to do with the difference in temperature between day and night, that wind comes mainly in the night and in the evening and therefore is a very good complement to the solar uh, energy that we can create during the daytime. If you zoom into Neom now and you would go there, you would find, I would say, one of the biggest construction sites in the world. Imagine that you're building a land like a country. I mean, it's the size of Belgium. And uh, building this complete country is, I think it's comparable with building the pyramids, you know, in Egypt. It's a huge, huge project. And uh, the only difference is the Egyptians took 3,000 years to build the pyramids. We only have 3,000 days to build Neom. Yeah. If you look at the people on the ground, then first of all, it's about 1,500, we call them Neomians, people that are on the payroll of Neom Company and that work for Neom Company, and we're increasing. I think within the next 12 months we will double uh, that amount, but that's not the only people working there. I mean, we have construction workers and we have suppliers and we have a lot of other uh, companies that assist us. If you look at the total of that today, we're talking about 30 to 35,000 people. But as I said, we're ramping up. Our predictions, uh, if you look at 2025, is that we will have between 400 and 450,000 workers in Neom. So this first tenant in the Neom Industrial uh, City, uh, the green hydrogen plant, is converting water into hydrogen. And that's a simple process, but it needs a lot of electricity. And as this electricity in Neom is coming from the sun and the wind, we are allowed to call the hydrogen green hydrogen. Now, if you think of size, uh, current projects in Europe are ranking in the size between 25 megawatt to, say, upside 100 megawatt uh, capacity for electrolyzers. The first plant we are building is having 2,000 megawatt electrolyzing capacity. So that's really a, a huge step up from where today projects are. And I think the very special thing of it is, this is a commercial project. It's not a subsidized project. You can't subsidize projects at that scale. And the fact that uh, with the sun and the wind electricity that we have available, we can make this green hydrogen at rather competitive costs. 2000 megawatt of electrolyzing capacity means 650 tons of hydrogen per day. That's about roughly a quarter of a million tons of hydrogen per year. That really moves the needle because with that volume you can look at building up uh, infrastructure uh, for hydrogen filling stations, for hydrogen transport, all these things are possible. So the green hydrogen plant is uh, being built in Neom, but it is a joint venture where the expertise of Neom and the knowledge about Neom is brought together with the knowledge of Aquapower, who will be responsible for the renewable generation part, and the knowledge of Air Products, who will be responsible for the processing plant and for the distribution of uh, the uh, hydrogen. So those three, each for one third, are the risk-sharing partners in uh, that joint venture. They are the drivers of this, 
We then went out to the market and we looked at what is the technology that we want to apply that allows us to produce this hydrogen commercially. And uh, for that a few key decisions have been made. I think the main one is on the electrolyzer capacity for which we have chosen the alkaline based uh, electrolyzer uh, technology from ThyssenKrupp. But uh, the hydrogen in order to transport it will be converted to ammonia on site. So we have a large ammonia factory next to the hydrogen plant and uh, we're going to use Helder Topso uh, technology and some intellectual property of air products uh, to produce that ammonia and that, that ammonia will then be shipped from the port of Neom to any place where uh, the ammonia or the hydrogen is needed because the good thing of ammonia is it can be converted back to hydrogen rather easy. But we can use existing ships, existing infrastructure, existing storage to transport the ammonia and therefore we are bypassing the current pro uh, problem that hydrogen cannot yet be transported over large distances in large volumes. Uh, that will come over time but for now we use ammonia as a proxy to do that uh, transport. Well, the good thing of NEOM is its location. We can reach 40% of the world population within four hours of flight. Now, for transporting ammonia, that's not uh, the real uh, preferred uh, medium, but uh, it is located just uh, at the entrance of the Suez Channel. So you can imagine from Neom, you can easily go up north uh, to the Mediterranean, to Europe, but also the other way down south to Asia is very well possible. You can even imagine to transport it to the United States. So which of those markets we will serve will depend on the policies that are being brought in place in those regions by the politicians, be it the European Commission or the national uh, governments, or the United States, California or Florida or New York, or Japan or Korea. All of those markets are looking for green hydrogen to convert their uh, energy system towards uh, less carbon and uh, we are there to serve and to sell it to, to uh, the one that makes best use of it. So for the production of uh, uh, green hydrogen you need a lot of electricity, that is renewable electricity, but you also need water. A water we have a lot in Neom, unfortunately it is salty water from the sea. On land there's not a lot of, uh, of water available, so we need to convert, desalinate the water from the sea in order to use it for the hydrogen production. Now the good thing is you don't need a lot of water for producing uh, hydrogen, but you do need it and if you do that in a conventional method, you're using grey electricity, now that's not good for the carbon footprint, so we are using renewable electricity for the desalination, but in addition with desalination you have the problem of what do you do with the leftover. Because if you extract pure water from the sea, what's left over is a pretty salty substance that uh, in the history always have been dumped back into the sea. And we see the impact on the marine environment, which is not positive. So in Neom, we've taken the challenge of zero liquid discharge. Nothing goes back into the sea. And that means that we process this remainder, we call it brine, into its individual elements. Next to salt, there are a lot of other products in there. We're talking about magnesium oxide, we're talking about potassium, bromium. All of them, if you can extract them in the purest form, are very valuable materials. So next to uh, the green hydrogen production, this will become a clean resource production, mining from the sea in addition to the green hydrogen. And you can imagine that there's a lot of industry that can develop on the back of those materials. If you have salt, you talk about processing industry, because this is not salt for your potato chips or for on the road when it's snowing. This is industrial quality, uh, industrial grade salt that is used in processes. Well, I think there's a lot of wrong perception towards Saudi and what Saudi is doing. I mean, the world, and I'm talking not only individual countries or the European community, but the world in general was desperately looking for oil and gas. And if that is what the world needs, then, you know, the service mind just uh, supplies that. What we now see is if the world is changing and is asking for different products, that the Saudis are flexible and are uh, sufficient business oriented to go with that changing uh, need. Now what we clearly see, and that is I think important, Saudi has always been a very reliable 
supplier of energy to the world. And it will continue to be that. It wants to continue to be that. And if the world is asking for a different form of energy, and if the ingredients for that, the sun and the wind, are available within Saudi, then it's a logical choice that it goes that way. In parallel to that, what I see, and I'm now in uh, Saudi since a uh, little bit more than three years, is a younger generation coming up. I mean, Saudi is a large country, if you look at the size of it, but it's also a populated country. I mean, uh, something like 40 million people uh, living uh, here in total. And 60% of them is younger than 35, maybe even younger than 30. So that generation has a different view on their future, which is further away, and is looking at things like uh, climate change and future energy needs in a different way than the past generation were doing. And I think that change of the generation is driving the change that is happening in Saudi. And that is very uh, promising for the future because the world will need a lot of green hydrogen and it can only apply it if that green hydrogen is produced at very competitive costs, which is possible in Saudi. The current, but also the future generations in Saudi know that the time of hydrocarbons in its current form will run out. And if your economy is based to 90 plus percent of income from hydrocarbons and you know that is running out, then you uh, don't need to be a smart citizen to think about something that needs to be started now in order to replace that wealth in future. So the plan A is using the current money that is available that comes out of hydrocarbons to build for the next generation and for the future I would call the plan A that uh, survives until the time after the hydrocarbons. Now having said that, hydrocarbons will not change or will not disappear from the earth completely and immediately. But what we see is a different use of hydrocarbons. Instead of using hydrocarbons for, I would call it the cheap usages, burning it to create heat or to create mobility, is not the most smart thing to do if that product can be used also for durable carbon alternatives. So uh, be it high performance products, uh, there's a lot of uh, other products than fuel or uh, gas for power stations where hydrocarbons can be used. So we see that movement and we see that Saudi is investing in petrochemical activities and in this kind of further downstream products and at the same time it is uh, replacing the current use of hydrocarbons by the alternative which is creating heat and creating power from renewables and creating movement, mobility on the basis of either electricity or on the basis of hydrogen and fuel cells. So I think this is a very strategic and a very convincing uh, strategy and therefore Saudi fully behind that and it's not a kind of a uh, ceremonial deed. No, this is really investing in the future and they're determined to do that. So in five to ten years we will see a turnaround from initial investment done by the state into third-party investment that take the opportunities of what is there. And I believe in the fundamentals that are behind NEOM, which is its location. It's close to a lot of hotspots and populated areas in the world. It's easy to reach. It is its climate. It's not uh, Middle East climate. It's uh, basically subtropical. It's uh, 10 degrees cooler in NEOM in average than in the rest of the Middle East. So that is an advantage. And then the vast beauty of its nature. We have in front of the coast some of the beautiful beaches, the most beautiful uh, coral reefs, uh, hundreds of islands, and the Red Sea is known for its beauty. So bringing all of that together, and that in a country of the size of Belgium, that next to the sea and the beaches has mountains, has desert, has all of that, in uh, its concentration is pretty unique. And if you look at those unique factors that I believe NEOM needs to and must become a success, it's just a matter of time and it's a matter of the initial investment until it starts growing on its own. Because uh, the question when is NEOM ready is simply to answer. It will never be ready, you know. Uh, Rome has not been built in one year and Rome uh, has not been finished 
either, you know, and NEOM will continue to grow, but it is important that we set the seeds and that we kickstart it until it becomes a autonomous growing uh, initiative on its own.